everyone. Welcome to worship today. We're so glad you could join us. Whether you're someone who regularly worships with us on a Sunday morning at on site on Stewart Avenue in Las Vegas, or you're someone who discovered us on YouTube, or a friend or a family member, we are glad that you are all here and that we have gathered here to worship this day. I'm Reverend Susan Holden, lead pastor here at Journey, and our worship team is working hard to provide and create new experiences for us during this extraordinary time where we worship uh, virtually together. And so today we're going to invite you to be a uh, a little more participatory even as you gather in your living rooms and in your homes. If you have a candle, could you go and find it and bring it and set it at the table near where you are watching? Together, we are going to light the light of Christ among us. While you're getting your candle ready, I want to remind you that Journey is still here. We are still here for you. We are still here to pray for you and to care for your needs. And so if you have prayer requests, if you have a need for something, uh, someone to deliver groceries or you just need someone to talk to, be sure and contact the Journey office and we will uh, connect you with someone who is prepared to help you and to care for you and to pray for you. And so now we light a candle as we invite Christ into our midst, as you light your candle, know that the light of Christ is living among us. God of our hearts, here we are, physically apart but united in worship. We've come with longing hearts praying that your word will satisfy us. We come with aching hearts, praying for good news to comfort us. We come with overflowing hearts, praying for a chance to share your love. Who know our hearts and hear our prayers, be with us now, our hour of worship.
morning we continue our journey through Lent as we step inside the heartbreaking story of saying goodbye to friends. If we dare to step inside the frame of the story and to look around at what's going on there, perhaps even put ourselves into the story as a character, what questions might we ask? It's a story not only of saying goodbye, but it's a story of the great teacher passionately embodying the kingdom of God, that he is so desperate that his disciples understand. Dare we step in to the story? How might we be changed if we do? I believe the invitation is for you as it is for me. Know this, our lives consist of continual moments where we can be aware, where we can notice, where we can offer ourselves in thanksgiving and humble service to both friends and strangers. Know that you are forgiven and freed for such a life of abundant service. You are encouraged and loved by a God who desires for you to live fully. Let us enter now as those forgiven and freed brothers and sisters of Christ into the passion of Christ. I invite you now to turn and greet whoever is in the room with you in ways that offer peace and reconciliation. And if you are alone, then perhaps you might want to think of someone that you would like to offer peace to and just say a brief prayer for them. The peace of Christ fill us now as we continue in worship. Our first scripture comes from Luke chapter 22, verses 14 to 23. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For you, I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine till the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This is cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant, in my blood but see the one who portrays me is with me and his hand is on the table for the son of man is going as it has been determined but who to that one is whom is is betrayed then he began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this
Good morning. We're here for children's time again. We're going to continue in our special time of year called Lent, a time of growing close with God. Before we jump in our story for today, I want to introduce you to my little friend here. His name is Shoni. Um, and let's prepare with our prayer. We will dare to join the journey. We will walk in your loving way. We will live your sacred story through the things we do and say. Amen. In today's story, we find ourselves at another meal called the Last Supper, or the Lord's Supper. This was the meal that Jesus shared with his friends on the night before he died. We are going to focus on a very special part of that gathering, and it involves us playing a bit a little game listen carefully to the story and every time you hear me mention a part of the body Shoni's gonna touch that part and you touch yours got it let's enter the story together Jesus knew the time was getting close when he would leave this world he wanted to have one last meal with his disciples Jesus loved his friends very much and wanted to make sure that not just their tummies were full, but their hearts as well. So he found a special way to show his love for them. Jesus got up from the table and tied a towel around his waist. He filled a basin with water and got on his knees. It's a little challenging for Shoni to have some knees here, but then Jesus began washing the feet of his disciples. But when Jesus came to Peter, Peter shook his head and said, you will never wash my feet. Jesus said, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but you will later. Peter said, then also wash my head and my hands. Jesus said, it is enough to wash your feet. You are clean. Then Jesus said to all of them, do you know what I have done for you? The disciples were all ears. Jesus continued, you call me teacher and Lord, and that is correct. If I, your Lord, have washed your feet you too must watch wash each other's the disciples eyes were filled with awe Jesus continued I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you you must love one another this is how everyone will know that you are my disciples when you love each other Jesus' words had truly touched the disciples' heart. Thousands of churches around the world commemorate this part of the story on a special night called Maundy Thursday. Maundy comes from the Latin mandatum, meaning commandment. It is based on Jesus' words we have just heard. I give you a new commandment that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you must love one another. This passage is closely linked to Jesus' humble act of washing the disciples' feet, a surprising thing for a master to do for his disciples. I would like each of you to think silently about this. What is a surprising way you can show love for Jesus? What is a special way you can show love for others? Now let's all take a deep cleansing breath through our nose and out gently through our mouth and close in prayer. Loving God, help me to be a part of the story, knowing there's no job too low when it is done out of love. Amen. Thank you for joining me this morning. If the disciples had been paying attention they would have the heard Jesus' own proclamation of his call to free those held
captive, especially the last among society. And taking the place of a slave, he shows forth the fulfillment of this role. One that be further fulfilled and dying as a common criminal. Remember Jesus' words from earlier time. Hear these words from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. When he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue was fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. My master's banquet at Hall of, Hall of Stairs was booked for this night, and the time had arrived for this evening group to come for the banquet. All was prepared according to the wishes. I was ready with the water and basin as I always am. Years ago, my parents had given me to the owner as collateral to, for the debt they had owed me, but things did not go well for them, and debt has never been paid. And so I worked to pay it off. Roman law says someday I could be a free person, but I will, ne but I will never again have, have the full rights in society, like like those who have, like those who have ne never been slaves. It is it is a marker for life. I keep my head down, and do what the do what the masters ask, because legally he has the right to punish. Abuse and humiliate me. I have witness. I have witnesses. It happened to others. Right now, I have no rights. So there I was with the bull, just waiting for, for the go ahead start. <coughs> it would be the honor. It would be an honor guest first, of course. And I knew which which one that was, by where he was. On that evening, Jesus himself modeled everything that he had been trying to teach his disciples. He demonstrated for them what it meant to be a servant leader, to take on the role of a slave. He showed them that a servant leader takes on the role of freeing others, not only from the guilt of sin, but also from its bondage. Washing others' feet may seem shocking to us, but more out of dis disdain for feet, then the real reason. It was shocking to those first disciples who see it was Jesus' stature as the master, teacher, and honored guest that made him first in line to be served, certainly not to be a sermon. It had never been like that before. Never, never been like that before. As Deborah described in the children's time, sure, it was another meal. It's the second dinner that we read about during Holy Week in Jesus' life. But it had never been like that before. Like the story of the anointing that we talked about last time, Jesus gives us an imaginative and embodied picture of what the kingdom of God is like. But it, as far as the disciples knew, it was, well, it was a celebration, but it was nothing unusual. You see, it was the Passover. And Hebrews, for centuries and centuries, had celebrated the Exodus, God's 
freeing of the Israelites from the Egyptians and taking them out of slavery into the wilderness for headed for the promised land. Now, it was a, a Passover meal. That means that the Paschal lamb had already been sacrificed in the temple and it had been cooked. And Jesus had gathered with his best friends, his students, perhaps his family even, for the meal. And Jesus was the host of the meal. As was the custom, there was always an elder who led the community through the story. It was very scripted. It was very expected. Until that moment when Jesus took the bread and then the cup, and he told those gathered around, well, he called the bread his body, and he, he called the, the wine his blood, and then he told them to eat it. We really don't know or understand how repulsive that would have been to a first century Jewish person. It would have been the most disgusting, deplorable image or idea that they could ever imagine to eat flesh and drink blood. Hebrew people did not do those sorts of things. You see, those were the kinds of things that other uh, traditions did. Those were the things that the pagans did, but not Hebrews. And now Jesus is telling them something they had never heard before. It was never like that before. I can only imagine, can't you, the disciples taking the bread, which would have been a, a flat bread, tenuously passing it around, nervously looking at each other, perhaps elbowing the person beside them, did you hear what he just said? Uh, sure, Jesus. Eat your body, drink your blood. Yes, I think we forget what a strange and disturbing moment this must have been for Jesus' disciples. Jesus had taken a tradition that was supposed to be familiar and comforting and he had turned it inside out and upside down, and it's as though he had dumped it out. It was something entirely different to their ears. And as Jesus is confronting them with a new reality, I doubt it sunk in that this was both a physical reality and a spiritual one. John, the gospel writer of John, begins his story in the framework of love. He writes, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. And he had challenged them to embody that with a new kind of reality as he took the towel, as he took the water. He poured it into the bowl and began to wash the disciples' feet. Neither in the instance of the breaking of the bread, nor really in the washing of the disciples' feet, do we get the response from the disciples' perspective, except for Peter's. And when Jesus begins to wash his feet, he's incredulous. No, no, you are master, I am student. Are you going to wash my feet? No, 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 Jesus, you can't wash my feet. And that's when Jesus says to him, Peter, I know you don't understand right now what I'm doing, but someday you will. Unless I wash your feet, you can have no part of me. 
And of course, Jesus, Peter loves Jesus. And of course, Peter has seen this transformative work of Jesus. And he's not looking at giving up right now. And so he says, well then, Jesus, my hands and my head. And Jesus assures him that it's only his feet that he needs to wash. These words, these actions, I'm sure they must have just resonated in the ears of the disciples in the days to come. The pictures, the images must have been seared into their minds. If you were a disciple, how would you have responded? What might you have said or done? How would this experience impact you going forward? Well, that's the question that we get to ask as Christians every time we share in Holy Communion. We get to remember anew, recall those images that have been burned into our minds over the seasons of our lives. We get to allow those past emotions and meanings of communion and community to drift forward in our consciousness and to examine them and let them inform and marry with where we are in our life and faith journey in the moment. Where we are in this moment. Never before have we lived through something like this. It's as new and strange to us as it must have been to those disciples long ago. Given our situation today and the extraordinary times that we're facing, I'd like to offer three ways that especially the story of Jesus sharing that last meal at Passover might shape our lives today. First of all, I think that as Jesus stood with the bread, those simple elements, bread and cup, he might have been reminding us to never take anything for granted. He might have been reminding us to stop, to pay attention, to notice, and to give thanks. Giving thanks has always been a part of our faith tradition as we have inherited it from our Jewish brothers and sisters. A second thing I think that Jesus would want us to know today as he wanted his disciples to know then, even I can make a difference. Every one of those disciples was important to Jesus and Jesus knew that the way that they would live their lives going forward would be important to others, rippling out across the world. Even Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him, Jesus loved him. And he would want us to know, as he wanted them to know, you and you and you, you will and can make a difference, even in these difficult times if you respond and stay in tune with this Christ that lives in you. And the third thing I'd like to think about is this, these words that he says, as often as you eat it and drink it. As often as you eat it and drink it, remember me. My, our daughter Emily is a professional violinist living in New York City. And she started taking violin lessons when she was six years old. And she studied from a teacher who taught using a method called Suzuki. Some of you may be familiar with that method. It is very regimented and very structured. And so the first day when Emily and I went to meet her violin teacher, there were two things that she taught us. The first thing was this. I was the Suzuki mom. There was no other Suzuki parent for Emily. I would be her companion. She and I would work together. We had mutual and but different roles, but it would take both of us working.
working together for this musicianship to develop in Emily's life and skill. The second thing she said to us was, now, everybody always wants to know how much they'll be expected to practice. I have good news. Only on the days that you eat do you need to practice. Only on the days that you eat. Now that didn't mean that every day would be a full, intense hour of practice together. But what her teacher was saying was, take time, spend time every day with this instrument, learning to play it, learning how to let it teach you how to be a musician. I think that that is similar to what Jesus might have meant when he said, as often as you eat it, as often as you drink it, remember me. Remember to stay connected. Remember to take time every day to receive the nurture that we are given through scripture, through being in small group communities, through prayer, through worship, as we partake in the bread of life and the cup of promise. Be intentional as often as you drink it, as often as you eat it. These are the gifts of Jesus for us, just as they were for his disciples. And each day of our lives, we get a chance to step back into that story, to let it inform our lives, let it shock us, let it, let it knock us off of our feet. And especially during these times, we can remember that Jesus knows we've never done it like this before. Thanks be to God that we walk in the light of that Christ. May it be so for you and for me. So, it is neither the first Sunday of the month, Communion Sunday, nor are we gathered together in one physical space. But the story of the Last Supper and the way that Jesus frames our life of faith and community tells me that it's a good time, even now, for us to partake, to give thanks, and to share a meal together in our own homes and in our own spaces. Jesus used the parable of a great banquet to which all people are invited to describe the kingdom of God. It's the family of God. And he, as the host in the story, shouts to his servants, go, go to the highways and back alleys and urge people to come in so that my house will be filled. Jesus often invited the most unlikely guest to the dinner parties, and this frequently confounded the disciples and the Pharisees. In this way, Jesus was encouraging a deep love and connection beyond the social norms beyond the social norms, even including how it is that we connect today during this time of a challenge because of the coronavirus. Jesus knew that we humans need inclusion and connection. And so he reaches out to us saying, you too, you also, all of you have a place at the table. It's difficult at this time not to be near some of the people we love and might be worried about. So let's take a moment right now to just say the names of the people who we wish were with us now. For myself, I wish that my children were with me. They are in New York and Miami and down further south in Las Vegas. Jesus is no longer physically on earth, yet every time we gather around a table at any meal, we can call him to mind. He is present with us in spirit. And so too, 
our loved ones are present with us in spirit. Let this be a comfort to us. We also want to call to mind the people who we cannot name, but whose names we know need to be lifted up, who we know need our prayers this day. Will you join me as we pray for those who have lost loved ones? We pray for their comfort. We pray for those who are sick and recovering. We pray for healing. We remember those who are caring for loved ones, those who are caring for the sick at home, those who are caring for persons needing medical care, especially in this time of great need. We pray for their strength and well-being. We pray for those who are separated from loved ones, and those who are feeling alone and isolated. May they feel the assurance of the presence of the great love. We pray for those who are helping and are so very weary at this time. May they find restoration and rest. For those who are struggling this day to find friends, support, food, and even the comforts of a roof over their heads, we pray for these, that those needs might be met. We especially pray for those who are afraid today, the fears of the unknown, fears and worries of being sick, fears of losing job and source of income. Oh God, you know our needs, you know our prayers. We give you thanks that you are always more present to us than we can perceive or understand. And in you, you are able to do immeasurably more than all that we could ever ask or imagine. Blessings at the table are part of our Judeo-Christian heritage. And so I invite you now as a great amen to our prayer that you would bring those items that you have chosen to share with us, those comfort foods, that snack food, your breakfast, your cup of coffee. Bring them at this moment and let's raise them up I've chosen to bring oranges, to bring cuties. I'm so grateful for these delicious little uh, cuties. So we lift them up and we give thanks. And we let it bless us on our way. As we pray together, the prayer printed on the screen. Holy Comforter, we gather in your name, invited by Jesus, bound together with your spirit, in union with each other. Feed our bodies and our spirits with your comforting presence so that we might be your comfort to others. Bless this food and break open our hearts. Bless this drink and pour out your love as you gather your disciples for a meal as you gathered them long ago, and as we gather in your name today, we pray, pray the prayer that you taught them, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you pass your plates around with any who are gathered there with you, as you get ready to continue and eat your comfort food, once we have signed off here, 
I encourage you to imagine what extravagant love looks like to you, even in a time when it's never been like this. May it be so. Amen. The practice of giving back a portion of what God has blessed us with is part of our faith tradition that is thousands of years old. When a blessing and inspiration to know that when we give to the ministry of the church, we are walking and living in the faith of Jesus. Today we are separated physically, but we are united in our call to serve others in our community. One of the most important ways we are doing that right now is by developing our presence online. Your generous giving supports Journeys Outreach Ministries through social and electronic media. Through this ministry, we are already inviting and welcoming new friends, family, and neighbors who might be looking for this kind of spiritual faith community. We hope to just keep getting better at creating a community where there is hope, joy, trust, diversity, inclusivity, a place to grow in faith centered around a common purpose, yet outwardly focused. After all, we are a Christian community sharing love and service with all people as we grow into God's word. We are journey. We invite you to take some time right now to prepare your weekly tithe or offering and to choose a convenient way to get that to us. We know it's difficult now and different. It's not as simple as dropping a check into the offering plate. We want to make it as easy as possible for you to give. Here are some of the options you can choose. And you can always go on our website, scroll down the left side of the homepage, select online donation, and follow the prompts on Breeze, our online giving format. However you choose to give, we are grateful that you do. Let us pray. Bread of life, living water, source of all that is good. You give us a new commandment to love others as you have loved us. In gratitude for your love, we offer these gifts. Multiply their fruits as we faithfully serve and share your generosity with those who hunger, thirst, who seek comfort and healing. Bless the ones who receives and the one who gives. Amen.
for joining us for worship, everybody. We hope you found something meaningful for your life during the service and something you can take with you that encourages you and helps you to stay strong and centered in the coming week. We'll be right back here next week, ready to celebrate Palm Sunday and to continue our journey through Holy Week. You might want to go ahead and clip some palm branches from your yard if you have them, or if you don't have live palms, you could get creative and just use any kind of branch or flower, even one that you've made from whatever craft materials that you have at home. The idea is that we will be all actively participating in the stories of Jesus in worship next week. Also, Journey has been a supporter of the Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth for many years, and we want to keep helping them out. So we have set up a collection box for any of those personal hygiene or travel items hand sanitizer, cleaning and disinfecting products, water bottles, or anything else that you can donate. The box is beside our mailbox, and if you pull up to the front of the church, just swing by and drop those items in the box. One of our volunteers will make sure to deliver those to the Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth. We hope that you'll stay connected with us on Facebook and YouTube in the coming week. Pastor Susan is going to be offering some extra meditations and ideas for spiritual practices that will help us to connect with creation, with our hearts, and with each other. You don't want to miss those. Starting on Monday morning, you can find them uploaded on Facebook. If you're wondering about services for Holy Week and Easter, please know that we are making plans to follow those traditions in every way possible. Given that we don't know when we will be able to come together in person again, know this, Easter will come. Easter always does, and we will celebrate. Be sure to join us next week to find out more. Lastly, don't forget that we are here for you. Reach out to us with your prayer requests, concerns, and needs. Go to journeytogether.com for contact information. So long for now. Grace and peace be yours this day.
And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who invites all to partake in the love of God who has created and provides all that we need and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit who prompts and guides us be with you now and always. Amen.